this animal has my heart right okay. now. Okay. Uh, it's really weird and it's kind of ugly. If you will Google how it looks like. Uh, it's naked mole rat. Oh, I love naked mole rats. They're so cute. <laughs> they just, they do look so weird though. They're so ugly, but they're so cute. Yeah. Hi everybody and welcome back to The Voice Podcast, a podcast by students for students. My name is Tiffany. And my name is Alice. And we are doing a little bit of something different today. Um, on the Intro to Hosts episode, we talked about uh, making an episode to do with interesting medical science facts. So that's what we decided to do today. Uh, a little disclaimer, neither one of us are scientists. We're just science nerds here to share information on topics that we found interesting. Um, so what do you have for us first? I think I'm going to start with an CAR T-cell therapy. Uh, which is a kind of a new way to try to treat cancer. Uh, start from the beginning. Uh, right now, one of the two mostly used types of cancer treatment is radiation therapy or chemotherapy. And the point is to try to kill cancer cells before we kill the patient. It's really toxic, it's harmful for the health, and it's really, it's time consuming, basically. There are a lot of steps of chemotherapy, of radiation therapy, it takes a lot of time, and we're not even sure if it's gonna help, and if it will help, how long will it last? So right. maybe yeah. cancer will come back in like a, a year after kind of a cure. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is a type of immune therapy when we basically program our own health system, our own immune system to try to kill cancer cells. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, that's which so is fun. exciting. Um, so uh, one of the types of cancer is uh, blood cancer. Mm -hmm. It's lymphoma, leukemia, a lot of, there are a lot of types of it. Uh, and the thing is, uh, what, well, the one that I'm gonna focus on is beta cell uh, lymphoma. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the type of cancer that research was based on. Okay, yeah. Uh, so there are two types of cells in bone marrow, is beta cells and T cells. Uh, T cells are basically T... The, these are both the cells of immune system. And if it's B cells, lymphoma, all of the B cells, well, not all of the B cells, in one particular bone, in one particular uh, place in our organism, beta cells decide that they're not gonna grow as they should grow. Right. <laughs> they're gonna become a cancer cells. And then they replace kind of all of the beta cells in all organism, uh, well, all normal cells, they replace it with cancer cells. That's why it's dangerous. <laughs> right. <laughs> Basically. Um, what's the point? of CAR T cell therapy. Uh, the first patient was Doug Olson. Uh, the research was uh, in Penn University, okay. I believe. Yeah. The thing was, uh, the scientists decided to take the blood of the patient, uh, to take his T cells and to kind of program them. Uh, it's like uh, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, some of the COVID-19 vaccines right now, uh, we basically uh, insert a different DNA into our cells, and so they those cells grow little spikes. Right, so you're talking about like the RNA, um, yes. like messenger technology? Exactly. Right, which is like a recipe, basically. Yeah. It's like here, have a recipe for how to make this particular exactly. thing. Exactly, yeah. And then program your own cells to do it. Yeah, we yeah. kind of give them instructions. Uh, but the difference is in the vaccines, it's like one time uh, instruction. So they just grow spikes and then that's it. And for this one, uh, we like would program them. Uh, so all of the cells grow spikes and then when they make more cells from those, like. A couple of thousands of cells that we changed in the laboratory, all of the cells are gonna have spikes. Okay. And in the end, uh, so it's kind of easier because uh, before that, 
uh, how we try to treat lymphoma, leukemia, we try to uh, transplant bone marrow, uh, which is, well, first of all, it's hard to find a donor of bone marrow. Uh, and here we just use your own blood to treat you. Oh, so it's like an auto transfusion. Yeah, kind of. Uh, it is costly. Yeah. Uh, and it is, uh, it's dangerous. Uh, because there is a, well, when all the T cells, all the new T cells, uh, they start to kill all of the beta cells, like the whole line, no more beta cells in the organism. Oh, okay. Uh, it kind of harmful for the immune system itself, but at least it gives kind of an insurance that we, well, cancer won't come back. Because it's, if, if it's beta cells, lymphoma, no more beta cells, no more lymphoma. Right, right. Which is nice. Yeah, so I guess that, like, permanent remission, like, yeah. guarantee that there's no recurrence of the cancer, it's like, so that's a big benefit. It is. But, yeah, you have to wonder what the long-term immunological um, um, deficits will be, right? Like, yeah, but, well, th those patients that got this treatment, they definitely has to take some um, immune immune system treatment, like the patients with HIV get. Okay, like an antiretroviral kind of... Yeah, kind of like, like that. Immune booster. Yeah, immune of. boosters, exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. But what the main risk is that... So we have a lot of that beta cells in the organism, uh, so it causes kidneys to work really really hard and then sometimes you just stop working because it's too much it's too much to process uh, okay uh yeah that's one of the side effects of this treatment uh but we had some patients uh some adult patients adult also and as i mentioned before and then this therapy was also um well some kids who got this therapy it's more dangerous for kids but still sometimes that's the only way uh, in some countries you can use the we can use this treatment but only for terminal patients right because yeah. the risks are unknown, yeah the right? risks are really high um but right now while we can treat with it we can treat lymphomas we can treat different forms of leukemia and we can treat multiple myeloma which is one of the most dangerous and that was actually the goal of the researchers that were doing this type of therapy for the first time they wanted to try to treat multiple myeloma and now it's possible right that's so cool that's such a neat therapy it's so different from the like traditional cancer therapies that are out there right now it you is. mentioned before like chemo and radiation they're they're like targeted well, radiation is targeted towards the tumor, but you're going to kill healthy cells along with yes. the cancer cells, and that comes with its own host of problems. And then chemo has just got so, so many side effects, and um, there's no guarantee that you'll stay in remission. All right. Yeah, so, I mean, the the idea that this treatment could prevent cancers from coming back is... A big, yes. big thing. Well, That's so cool. Especially if it's uh, like a if it's a cancer that co that was caused by a certain uh, type of cells, like right? Beta cells, for example. Yeah. There is no more beta cells. They can just come in. Order. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I wonder how that would work for cancers that are more like organ targeted, like because uh, you wouldn't want to kill all yeah. of the cells in your liver or, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure if this. This treatment mm -hmm. can be used for this type of cancer. Uh, it's pretty new technology. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty costly. And so research is still in process. And we see that before we could treat just one type of cancer now, uh, several types. If it's mostly black cancer. Yeah. 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 I wonder if eventually they'll be able to adapt that kind of technology to do other things. Like I, mm -hmm. I had heard actually, I, um, when they came out with the mRNA vaccines for mm -hmm. COVID, I had been doing some research about it, and there was some pretty significant evidence that they could use that to treat cancers. Yeah. Um, they haven't fully finished, obviously, realizing that potential, um, but I think that's really, really cool. You basically just 
retrain your own cells exactly. to to get rid of disease, which is uh it's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's super cool. We don't. It's like we don't need donors. We don't need any. We don't have any other risks that are related to transplant of something because our organism can just say no. No, we're not working with that. It, right, the the risk of yeah. rejection of yeah, a like I'm pretty sure it's harmful. No, right, yeah, yeah, because that's one of the biggest risks of transplantation is a rejection because yeah. your body's just like mm, that doesn't belong in here. Yeah, let's get rid of that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if you like your own cell, your body won't reject your own cells, mm-hmm. which is super cool. That's why something like that would be really cool technology. Oh, I love that. Now my brain is like spinning my mind is spinning with all of the potential there's so much potential and you said it was c-a-r-t therapy uh c-a-r yeah yeah okay cool guess who's going home to do more research (laughs) (laughs) okay um so my first like interesting medical fact i'm not going to tell you what it is first i'm going to give you a bit of background information on it first Um, so this particular process stars a little bacteria by the name of Escherichia coli. I can't pronounce that word very well. Also Mm -hmm. known as E. coli. Most of you have probably heard of E. coli. Um, it has a more complicated first name. That's (laughs) way more familiar. Um, so that's the star of today's show. Um, and then a few other kind of like background pieces of information you need to know are just generally how bacteria work. So bacteria divide themselves through a process called binary fission, where it's basically just like one bacteria splits into two exact copies of itself, which split into two exact copies of that. Um, So that's how it divides, rather than human cells have a much more like complicated uh, process. Um, DNA bacteria, or sorry, bacterial DNA can change through three different methods. There's uh, conjugation, Mm -hmm. transduction, and transformation. So this particular medical fact has to do with transformation, but I'll kind of give you the like little rundown on the three types. So conjugation is vertical or horizontal transfer of data. So bacteria have these little like hair-like projections on Mm -hmm. the outside of them called uh, a pilus, where they basically can like come up to each other, touch piluses and transfer DNA to each other. So that's horizontal conjugation. They basically just exchange information by bumping up next to each other. Mm-hmm. You also have vertical transfer, which is when uh, binary fission happens. The one bacteria transfers its exact DNA signature to the two that it makes. Um, and then there's another method called transduction. This is like a cool fact on its own, so maybe look this up later. Um, it's when a bacteriophage, which is a virus that specifically only targets bacteria, okay. like attaches itself and gets into the bacteria and then changes its DNA, which is kind of cool. But that's called transduction. But transformation is the focus of today's interesting fact. And it's the introduction of DNA from another source outside of the cell, from some kind of like donor um, Mm -hmm. to the cell. Um, So those are kind of your rundown of the fact. (laughs) Um, So basically when uh, like transformation is usually facilitated by humans. So what we do is we take some kind of DNA sample from something, usually a person. We extract a plasmid, which is like a small circular piece of DNA. It usually just contains one or two genes, not a whole lot of information. We shock the bacteria using heat or electricity um, because it kind of like confuses it and it lets stuff pass through its cell membrane. And then once inside, the plasmid combines with the DNA of the bacteria. It sucks it in. And then when it divides, when it, it performs conjugation... Those two bacteria that it makes now have that DNA. So th- that's kind of like a cool little process. So I, I, when I heard of that process, I was like, oh, that's, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, why would we use that? What is the point? We use this technology to make insulin. That's how we make wow. insulin for people. <laughs> so you take a small blood sample from a person, like mm-hmm. five mils of blood. And then scientists can actually take out the genetic code for insulin. So in our DNA, we have a string of code that tells our body how to make insulin. Mm -hmm. So we take that out. We add a little magic to it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know. There's a lot of more complicated steps in this. I'm really like bare bones in it. But 
they add something called a tracer. So it's either like a piece of code that makes the bacteria a certain color or um, makes them resistant to something just so that we can separate which bacteria actually take the DNA and which ones don't. Um, and then we, so we make a plasmid out mm -hmm. of the, the DNA that codes for insulin. And then we uh, add it to a, a sample of, of E. coli. Um, and basically we apply heat or electroshock, shock the cells, the bacterial cells, and then they absorb the plasmid inside. Um, so now floating freely around inside of these bacteria is the instructions on how to make insulin. Then the DNA combines and then the cells split. Mm -hmm. And so as the bacteria split, there's more and more and more of them. And because they're now coded for insulin production, these bacteria are just freely making insulin. They're just pumping insulin out until they're all full of it. Um, and then we just extract that insulin when we're done. Like when we think we have enough, we just collect it all. It's so, cool. so yeah, <laughs> so then we harvest and purify it and um, e. coli has a tendency to make something called an endotoxin, basically like mm -hmm. a protective measure. Um, but we can we can get rid of that, and then we just package it up for human use, and it's called recombinant DNA technology. And uh, my mind was like literally blown when I heard that. I was like, "What do you mean we make insulin with E. coli? <laughs> that's so cool." Work? So yeah, that's the the process of how humans synthesize insulin. Because it would be a little bit unethical to, like, harvest someone's pancreas. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little unethical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I thought that, that was really, like, a cool um, sort of, like, discovery. I, I want to know who, like, what scientist was sitting at a desk and then suddenly was like, you know, it would be a great idea if we fed some insulin genes to a bacteria and so, like, figured out what happens. Exactly. <laughs> who comes up with this stuff? But it's actually so cool because I think uh, both of our facts, well, the first fact, are kind of related because we basically uh, add instruction to the cell. So cell starts to synthesize something else. Yeah. Not what it's supposed to synthesize. And I, I honestly can't imagine how many more cool stuff we can see. With I know. With this, yeah. Like we, we've mapped like not the entirety of the genome sequence either so like you know we're trying really hard to figure out all these things there are endless possibilities to what we can do with like recombinant dna exactly. and genetic therapy where we can like change the cells themselves and reprogram them to do something differently and i'm just like <laughs> we cannot wait for the evolution to give us those things we can just yeah. make them yeah in the lab Exactly. Wow. It take yeah. And I mean, yeah, it would take how many thousands of years, tens even, of thousands of years yeah. to evolve these things. Um and we can just, And I'm not even sure if we will get them. Yeah. Because we can well, we can't predict that. Yeah, we can't control evolution, unfortunately. Exactly. Um but yeah, so and and because the bacteria divide so like quickly and easily, that's why we use bacteria rather than trying to like synthesize it inside of human cells, because human cells are slow. <laughs> they divide slowly and they don't divide the same the exact same way dna comes together in double strands so there's no guarantee that mm -hmm. the chromosomes are going to line up properly to get all of the so bacteria anyway are useful for that kind of thing and there are like all kinds of applications apparently for that yeah which i thought was really really cool i think e coli are used in kind of a lot of synthesis yeah so I'm equally sure. i guess is the the most like studied and well-known yeah. bacteria and it's also um, not super harmful, so it's something that we can play around with without a risk of, like, a global incident. Yeah. <laughs> it's just E. coli, don't worry too much about it. Um, so yeah, so that, I thought that was pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. what you got for me. Well, the second fact. Uh, it's not actually a fact, it's just the story of the migraine treatment. And I think that's exciting, because we... We just spent so much time. We had to learn so many more side things to come up just with the reason of why migraine exists. Why do we? Why do people have migraine? Right. What causes it? So the first question for you, actually, did you ever have migraine? Yes, I've had migraines before. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't, but well, my mom has them. 
and well, she had them before, she has them sometimes now. I know what it is. It's it's not the cool thing. You no, have, it can be pretty debilitating. People yeah. find it extremely hard to live with. Yes, yeah, sometimes uh, it causes like the um, speaking problems, especially when like it's almost migraine and yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of a that's a disease that we well people had for a lot a lot of years. If it was the first mention of migraine was like in ancient Egypt or something like that. Okay. So well, we knew that thing for a lot of years and we didn't know what causes it. Uh firstly, uh until I believe the beginning of 20th century people use morphine people use cannabis people use a lot of weird things to <laughs> treat it well they honestly tried everything so they use bloodletting for for different stuff mm -hmm. why not use bloodletting for treatment of migraine good old bloodletting <laughs> yes uh, i it honestly it also blows my mind why would you think that it will help but apparently I mean, it, yeah. it, we use I, leeches I for stuff so I, I don't know man <laughs> yeah uh they used to apply vinegar on like this this part of hat maybe this will help uh so yeah again a lot of actually poisons <laughs> and people well i guess it helped maybe because it just poisoned the organism for some people it helped, for some people it didn't. And we used that until like early 1900s, right. somewhere around that time. Uh, then scientists actually started to come up with some ideas why would migraine, uh, what, what would cause migraine? Uh, Sometimes we thought that maybe it's an allergy, it's some kind of an allergy because it also, well, it's genetically related. So if your parents have migraine, maybe you will have migraine. It also starts um, when a person is young. So maybe it's an allergy, maybe it's a, some kind of an allergy. Maybe it's hormonal. Uh, oh yeah, it's the microphone. <laughs> um, Maybe it's caused by trauma. Maybe uh, because you're, um, well, maybe you're just so exhausted. Maybe you're just so tired that it caused migraine. A lot, a lot of different reasons and all of them weren't actually true. Well, they were partially true, but not really. Uh, until uh, one scientist, uh, he was um, observing one lady with a migraine, um, he noticed uh, that, she, well, she actually had kind of, um, uh, she had kind of a lobotomy. One scientist, uh, he was uh, observing the migraines of one lady. Uh, and the thing is, before she had a lobotomy, uh, so she had a little like hole in her head, in her, yeah. Uh, because the before when she had a lobotomy, one doctor thought maybe I will do this and maybe it will help her with her migraines. Spoiler, it didn't. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, and he noticed that when she has a migraine, this hole, uh, the blood vessels in this hole, they kind of get gets bigger. So he actually can't see the hole. And then when migraine ends. He can see the hole again. Okay. Uh, so then he thought maybe it's somehow related to blood pressure. Maybe it's something about that. And then what blows my mind the most is we try to find the reason of migraine for so many years. And then we, well, for me, I feel like we kind of find it accidentally. <laughs> I love <laughs> accidental science. <laughs> yes. Uh, we were researching, uh, we were looking for different serotonin receptors, and we just found one, 5-HT uh, receptor, serotonin receptor. Uh, well, somehow, 
we found out that this uh, specific receptor uh, it activates when migraine comes. So we're like, oh. okay, maybe that thing is related. And then we synthesize a different um, substance. Uh, it's called ergotamine. Uh, ergotamine and serotonin, they're kind of a similar molecules, especially for our brain. It doesn't see the difference between serotonin and ergotamine. And then ergotamine was actually the first um, drug that was actually helping with migraine. And we knew how it worked. So it's not a poison anymore. Um, I'm really happy about yeah. that. Uh, and it's not bloodletting. Right. Yeah, it's not bloodletting. So that's always a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, it was in like 1970s. So it's pretty recently. Um, we found out that uh, we had 12 pairs of uh, cranium uh, nerves. Mm -hmm. And that when migraine starts, the third nerve is activated. And then we found out the substance that activates it, it and it's CGRP, uh, yeah, CGRP molecule. And then we synthesize CGRP uh, monoclonal antibodies, and now we use them to treat migraine. Uh, what kills me when I when I was reading about it, uh, we knew about this. Well, we knew about migraine for so many years, and then we could actually find out how to treat it only, in, well, almost in the 21st century. Yeah. Which is, wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, technology, medical technology has improved so much in the last yeah. century that we have discovered so many things just in the last century that just, like, completely yeah. blows my marbles out. Like, Yeah. And also... Uh, before we thought that migraine is just just a uh, just a headache, just really strong headache, and apparently it's not. It's something so complicated. Right. Why? Like why? Why would it exist? Why? What would start it? We were not even sure why CGRP starts to synthesize. What causes it? So to be completely honest, we are not really sure what causes the migraine. Like the, what what is the the first first thing that happens in right. our brain? So we know this like CGRP is the reason for the migraine, but we don't really know the trigger for the production of exactly. CGRP. Okay. Questions left unanswered. Yeah. There's a, actually, I believe that cranial nerve number three is called the trigeminal nerve. Yes, exactly. And there's a condition called trigeminal neuralgia, which mm -hmm. is, neuralgia just means pain inside of a nerve. And apparently it's like an absolutely debilitating, insane pain. Yes. And it's like in your face. Yeah. And like, I guess so the same, the same nerve causes the migraine yeah. so it, it travels all the way yeah, back it's, so. yeah also uh some a lot of people that has migraine tells that it starts somewhere around like in the around face basically yeah, like in like, the eyes yeah, or like... in the eyes and then it goes back so maybe that's why <laughs> yeah that's wild that's it is. wild but that's good news though that we like have some treatments for migraine yeah. that's not bloodletting or yeah. leeches or putting vinegar on our foreheads <laughs> Or a lobotomy. I mean, exactly. I've considered a lobotomy once or twice in my life, but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, no, that's so that's so interesting. We finally don't treat it uh, considering, well, it might help. I'm not sure why it will help, but it might help. Well, it helped like two out of ten people. So now we're going to use that. Yeah. It's not like that. We actually know the reasons. Well, we don't know the reason reason but we know the little reasons yeah the little reasons yeah I, I as somebody who's had migraines before i can pretty much tell you i would try anything to get rid of a migraine so Even that's probably why people tried like bloodletting and vinegar and stuff because when you're in the middle of a migraine you will do whatever you can to not have that migraine anymore so that's really cool though and i guess that that they must synthesize that chemical and make like a medication out of it, right? The yeah. CGRP. Yeah. And you can just take it as like a 
Yeah, as a pill, mostly. Yeah. Some of them are, like, intranasal sprays, too, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's the same, like, mechanism of back. Like, I wonder if it's the same medication or if it's something different. I'm not sure. It might be the CGRP. Uh, it might be the... Um, uh, it might be a, an ergotamine that right. I mentioned before. So it's like, uh, we actually found, we firstly found the reason, uh, we found the serotonin receptor, then we find the nerve, then we find found what causes the innervation of this nerve, and maybe we will find something yeah. else in the future. It's good news, migraine sufferers. Hopefully in the future you won't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so our last science fact of the day, um, I'm going to talk about antibiotic sensitivity testing. Um, so if you don't know what it is, it's a method that we use to test microorganisms to see which antibiotics will kill them. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, antibiotics is a bit of a misnomer that we use a lot. Um, it's actually antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. um, not all antimicrobials are antibiotics. Antibiotics are the ones that actually come from a biological source, like from, like penicillin mm -hmm. comes from a bacteria. Well, a mold, technically. It's yeah. A, a microorganism. Um, so not all antimicrobials are antibiotics, but all antibiotics are antimicrobials, if that makes Interesting. sense. Um, so, but we, we always just refer to it as antibiotics. Everybody yeah. does. As long as you know what antibiotics do, basically they deal with like bacterial or fungal or um, protozoan infections. Um, uh, not protozoan, prion infections. Um, but primarily we use them mm -hmm. for, for bacterial infections. Um, so when there's a sample taken of an infection. So whether it's like a urine sample or a blood sample or like a sputum sample, whatever, you think there's some kind of bacteria there growing, doing nasty things, um, send that to the lab. And then the lab makes a homogenous culture. So I'm sure you've seen those like round plastic Petri dishes. Yes. Yeah. So you can take those and you, you have different kinds of culture medium. So it's basically a like a gel that has nutrients in it. And we've got different types when we're looking for different things. But basically just use a nutrient agar, which is the gel on the inside. It just helps the bacteria have a food source so that mm -hmm. they can proliferate so that we can take a better look. Um, so a homogenous culture is just where we make one big culture on the entire surface rather than trying to isolate individual colonies mm -hmm. of this bacteria. And so we make this homogenous culture and then we take these um, little white uh, filter paper discs and we add the antibiotics to them and then we plunk them on top mm -hmm. and then we inoculate the sample for 24 hours. So we leave it to grow, let the bacteria do their thing, let the antibiotics try and kill the bacteria. And then when you take the plate out, if the bacteria is sensitive to the antibiotics you've put on, there will actually be like a ring around the little white paper disc where it's killed all the bacteria. Mm -hmm. And then they measure how far away from the white paper disc Mm -hmm. um, the bacteria were killed and each different antibiotic has a different like sensitivity range. So some of them will be like one millimeter. Some of them would be two millimeters or what? I don't actually know the, the measurements they use. <laughs> uh, I think it's actually nanometers that they use as a measurement, but um, basically that, that tells them whether or not an antibiotic will be able to kill a particular type of bacteria. Um, and sometimes you get, um, a, like a bacteria that's not susceptible to one particular um, antibiotic, but when they're next to each other, those two antibiotics, they have a crossover section mm -hmm. called like a synergistic area. Um, yeah. So if you give both of those together, they do a better job of killing the bacteria, which is kind of cool. Um, you can also have antagonism. So where two um, antibiotics kind of cancel each other out which is worse, right? Yeah. Uh, so what you would see instead is in that in-between section, instead of seeing more bacterial death, you'll see like actually amplified bacterial growth. Um, so it's kind of an interesting wow. little like fact. But yeah, that little circle around the disc is called the zone of inhibition, in case you were wanting to know that fact about. Uh, yes, I definitely, yeah, I want to You can that. keep that one in your brain bank now. So yeah, I just thought it was kind of cool that like, 
you know, you, you send a bacteria culture to the lab and they send you back a list of like, here's all the antibiotics that'll yeah. work on this. I was wondering how that process worked. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of cool that they just like plunk a bunch of different ones on top of a culture and wait. That's cool. <laughs> you know? Especially the one that cancel each other. So there are like more bacteria as well. Wow. Yeah. How so does it work? <laughs> I don't really know. That's a really great question. Like, I guess they just like make each other less effective it's probably if they're like biologically, like a biological derivative, mm -hmm. that probably those bacteria or fungus that they come from just don't jive with each other. Yeah, maybe. You know, and they just like cancel out some of the effectiveness. So, yeah. Um, it's a really great way to um, like target antibiotic therapy um, and prevent the misuse of antibiotics, I guess. Yeah. Like a big a big problem right now, actually, um, that a lot of people don't know about is antibiotic resistant bacteria. Yes. So you may have heard of some of them like um, VRE, MRSA, like these are um, bacteria basically that have um, evolved to become resistant. And then through the methods of like bacterial mm -hmm. division we talked about earlier, they have somehow shared that secret with each other <laughs> and proliferated with that secret um, intact in their DNA. So now they're all resistant. And that comes a lot from the misuse of antibiotics. So not finishing your course of antibiotics, taking the wrong antibiotic for uh, the wrong type of infection. So if we can find the most sensitive um, antibiotic for that particular infection, we can like just mm -hmm. blast it off the face of the earth and then we don't risk that bacteria a few of them surviving developing a resistance and then mutating and sharing it yeah right so um like making sure we're using the correct antibiotics a big way to prevent bacteria from developing a resistance to the antibiotics we have because we only have so many we only have so many available and we can't seem to find very many more <laughs> exactly that's that's a huge problem i'm not sure if in canada you can just go to the pharmacy and buy an antibiotic. Um, uh, so you stuff. can't. There are yeah. like there are a couple like um, bacitracin, which is like polysporin. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's like a topical cream that you can use. Mm -hmm. Like there are some forms of it, yeah. but you can't go to the to the drugstore and just buy an antibiotic. Yeah. Like, you have to get a prescription. Uh, but in some countries, like in my country, you can just go to the pharmacy and buy whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, in fact, and this causes a huge problem. Yeah. I know some people that try to keep. Would try to treat, um, I don't know, a seasonal flu with antibiotics. Yeah. Just because, well, they work better. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't, because antibiotics are not for viruses. We can't kill exactly. viruses with an antibiotic, unfortunately. That's not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I worked at a family doctor's office for a number of years. That was something that people would come in and be like, I have this cold. Can you give me an antibiotic for it? No. Well, no, because <laughs> that won't work. And then any of the like resident bacteria in your body could develop resistance yeah. to this. And then if they do make you sick, yeah. you're um, out of luck. Yeah. Because unfortunately, uh, bacteria can change kind of faster than we can develop uh, yes. antibiotics. And also they do it, uh, first of all, by chance. Second of all, they just, they don't have a logic. They just, well, they just mutate and that's it. Uh, and we, well, we can't just, try to mutate our antibiotics we have to yeah. like we have the logic but they don't so yeah we, i mean they're not they're not like a higher thinking power right bacteria's yes. literal only job is to survive and spread itself around yeah. so and it's, also, it'll do whatever it can yeah. to protect itself even if we can develop an antibiotic uh it takes a lot of time to actually create uh like a drug to sell in drugstores yeah, well, because you got to go through the, the safety yeah, testing, testing and all of that kind yeah. of stuff, too. It just takes time. It's nothing that we can do, yeah. like, in short order, yeah. you know? Like, oh, this this particular bacteria has developed a resistance. Okay, well, we'll just put another one out. That's not yeah. That's not how it works, unfortunately. It would be so much easier for us if it did. <laughs> yeah. But, no, tragically not. But, uh, yeah, so those are our, those are our interesting, like, medical science facts, uh, shared between a couple of science nerds. I don't know about you, but now yeah. I have things that I'm going to go and research after this. <laughs> so I've yeah. got, like, stuff in my brain. So it's like the wheels are spinning. Yeah. I don't know I if you can hear oh. the gerbil. Uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah. 
<laughs> I have a lot of questions about the bacteria and antibiotics. That's, wow. That's one of my favorite topics to discuss. Yeah, like microbes. Um, biotech. Yes, that it is one of my favorite topics to discuss. <laughs> yes, bacteria are so interesting. Just like microorganisms in general, yeah. I find fascinating because, like, bacteria are not the only microorganisms, right? Um, but the idea of like a bacteriophage, I was like, yes, that's I so know. cool. I know. <laughs> like, why did a virus suddenly decide, like, hey, I'm just gonna start infecting some bacteria? Because like viruses can can only live by infecting a host, right? Like, that's all they can do. And al also, the way that they look. Have you ever seen yeah. a picture? That's a spaceship. It's basically a bacteria <laughs> spaceship, yes. They're like, they have like a like a glass dome looking thing on the top mm -hmm. and then all these little legs. Like it yeah. looks like a little space robot. It is. I love it. They're so cool. It's so cool. Yeah, I find that so fascinating. And then like, like fungi and molds and stuff. I'm like, that's so gross, but it's so cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I just want to know more about fungi and mold. Yeah. And then like prions. Do you know anything about prion disease? I don't think so. so it's, um, the, prion stands for something and I, I can't remember what it is at the moment. It's like a shortened version of thing. But basically like it gets into your brain mm -hmm. and it causes, um, like neurological disturbance. Mm -hmm. So, um, have you ever heard of mad cow disease? It has a different name. Um, it's probably, no. not. it's, it's mm -hmm. something that was kind of around a lot in like se the seventies and people who would eat um cattle meat from europe mm -hmm. it had this prion inside of it and so we would ingest it it makes its way to your brain and then it starts causing like neurodegeneration and then you start like acting all crazy and like so prions are prions are cool mm -hmm. and my favorite like weird gross fact about prions is that like you can get a prion disease by um cannibalism ew yeah. <laughs> don't practice cannibalism, friends. Yes, please. <laughs> and also bloodletting. Yeah, don't practice bloodletting or lobotomies. Yeah. A lot of things that we've talked about today, <laughs> don't do it at home. <laughs> it's dangerous. I think I've heard something. It's kind of similar to the thing that you just discussed. Uh, it was about the um, migration of different species, but like using, uh, using humans. Uh, so... Uh, biological invasions basically okay. and I don't really remember what was the thing uh, but there is some some kind of a parasite that people from uh, Europe uh, brought here uh, with ships uh, okay yeah and then it infected a media or something so like something that we can eat right so like a food or yeah a, like drink uh, or something. yeah and then it infected fish and then uh seagulls started to eat this fish and uh the thing is that parasite uh synthesized some uh, botulin or something like that so okay it's like some some kind of toxin and then it affected seagulls that ed ate the infected fish and then they started acting crazy. They were like they, they were very aggressive. That's so cool. Yeah, like aggressive seagulls yeah, just losing their was, marbles. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, like with the with the mad cow disease, it um, the the cattle started acting that way too. They would mm. just start like stumbling around and acting really aggressively and like just super weird stuff. And then they would just drop dead. You know, like. Yeah. And then people started displaying these weird symptoms and they're like, what is going on here? And it turned out that it was like a prion that you get from mm -hmm. eating infected cattle. And it, that caused like a big, massive kill off of livestock, which mm -hmm. was really interesting as well. So economically, that was a disaster. I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, trying to think of like some of my other like favorite um, organisms. We're, we're learning a lot about, like, bacteria in our mm -hmm. microbiology class. Do you have, like, a favorite bacteria name? Not yet. Not yet. I have, like... I haven't had microbiology class oh, okay. yet. Um, I have a couple. Rickettsia rickettsii is, the, like, the literal name of a bacteria, and that just kills me. There's another one called Shigella shiga. Like, these names are just wild, yeah. but I love them. They're so much fun. 
So, and then uh, the ba- the name for the bacteria that caused, like, the Black Plague is Yersinia um, pestis, which, because mm-hmm. it transferred through fleas that were on rats, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, like a pestilence. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called Yersinia pestis, which is, I think, a pretty friggin' cool name. <laughs> yeah, it is. For something that was really awful. Okay. <laughs> if we're talking about our favorite weird organisms... I have one. Okay. That it I think I've the first time I've heard about it, it was this week I was listening to some podcasts and then I've heard about it and it well, this animal has my heart right. Okay. Now. okay. Uh, it's really weird and it's kind of ugly if you will Google how it looks like. Uh, it's naked mole rat. Oh, I love naked mole rats. They're so cute. <laughs> they just, they do look so weird though. They're so ugly, but they're so cute. Yes, exactly. And uh, it's so different from all other rodents that we know, like mice or just diff- just basic rats. They're so different. First of all, they are you e- e- socials. No, that that's not the word. We'll cut it off. Because <laughs> um, apparently I forgot the term. Uh, so they kind of live like uh, bees and ants. So they live in colonies. Oh. So they, have, they have a queen, they have soldiers, stuff like that. So each organism, every organism is like a part of a big system. They're not individual. That's really cool. It That's is, like some abnormal behavior for a it, mammal. It is the only mammal that we know right now that has this type of society, <sighs> let's call it society. Uh, that's why actually uh, scientists couldn't start doing research about them because they just couldn't get, um, well, more, more rats because they thought that there's going to be enough just a male and female, just like all other rodents. And apparently it's not a thing. You have to have a queen and then you have to have a colony for, so of the queen. Interesting. This. Uh, also, they kind of don't get older. So like the youngest one, they look exactly like the oldest one. And we know that all the small animals like squirrels mice rats everything like that they leave like two three four maybe five years do you know how long can you leave more rat? i have no idea they can leave for more than 40 years 40 years oh my god that's that's wild that's wild uh because that just break down the most popular theory of why do they live that small organism live less than big organisms because they have faster meta- metabolism and like the cell oxidates different substances and they have like this toxic products that just accumulates in the cells yeah and so if you have faster metabolism you will get more toxins faster and then you will die. But apparently it's not a thing because they live for more than 40 years. And they don't have T cells that I was talking about. <laughs> and they don't, they, they can't get cancer for some reason. What the heck, naked mole rats? They're so <laughs> weird. <laughs> so unusual. Oh my God, now exactly. I'm going to go home and look up everything there is to know about naked mole rats. Uh, too. And it's, it's kind of a new research. Uh, apparently, they can kind of communicate with each other and each colony um, squeeze the, the different way that they are the colony squeeze. And it's not genetic. So uh, the queen kind of says that this is how we say hello in our colony. And then if uh, two different uh, naked mole rats from two different colonies see each other and then they say hello in a different way, they are being aggressive towards each other, and but if you take like a just newborn naked mole rat from one colony and you put it in the other colony, they will learn how to say hello the other way. So it's not genetically. So a queen tells them. Why do we think it's queen who tells everybody how to speak? 
Because if a queen dies, and for a short period of time there's no queen in the colony, it's an anarchy. They just start squeezing randomly, just random sounds, and then a new queen comes, and then it's she's like, okay, now we're together. Yeah, now we're telling, <laughs> pronouncing this way. And That's it's, so weird! Oh my god, naked mole rats just blowing my mind over here. Science is so weird. Like, how does they, how does this stuff work? I don't understand. <laughs> I need to understand better. Oh, God. I hope there are some science nerds watching this podcast episode that are, like, so. freaking out <laughs> with me. Because, like, I'm freaking out on the inside right now. Like, oh, the possibilities. You know, I just, I have to, I have to go home and look up naked mole rats yeah. now. So I'm even, like, crying a little bit because I am so excited. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not the only person who does that. Um. <laughs> Yeah, because I was almost crying. I was yeah. so close. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I wish that, like, we could just not age the same as yeah. naked mole rats. But yeah, we. I mean, the, the whole reason for aging is that thing you were talking about. It's called oxidative stress. And mm-hmm. it's basically like certain things hurt your cells and mm-hmm. as you age, you lose the ability to fight those things off and then, and then your cells oxidize yeah. and die. And um that's when you start getting, like, gray hair and you start getting wrinkles and, mm-hmm. like, your skin loses elasticity because some of the yeah. cells are dead. Um, so if we could just, like, look the same forever. Like, mm-hmm. like you're born, you hit a certain age, yeah. and then you never look any older. Yeah. Okay. Nick and Mulrat's got it right. There's a new theory. Uh, sometimes uh, to... A Nick and Mulrat got a mutation that allowed it to live longer. So, uh... At the beginning, they lived the same, they had the same life, life like rats and mice. And then one of them kind of got a mutation that um, allowed them to live longer. And apparently, because they had like this consistent conditions under the ground, um, they could live longer and they could get more offspring. So then the offsprings had this mutated um, part of the DNA that allowed them to live longer. And then some of them maybe also got a mutation. So basically the idea is you live longer now because your cells are just dying, just because they're dying of the oxidation. Um, You're dying and you're getting older because uh, the kind of evolutionary, you know that, well, even if you will live longer, you won't, be able to get more offsprings so what's the point of living longer so maybe that's why they live longer right just to to procreate for a longer period of time yeah hmm but i mean it kind of makes sense though that like them living permanently underground that avoids a number of the like environmental stressors that cause oxidative stress like uv causes oxidative stress air pollution causes oxidative Mm -hmm. stress like those are two things that they're not not having mm-hmm. um, like changes in temperature can cause yeah. oxidative stress. So if they're sitting in a pretty like homeostatic environment, there's yeah. not a whole lot changing. Yeah, naked mole rats have it right. They know exactly what's up. Yeah. Okay, well this has been so much fun. <laughs> well, we probably <laughs> should stop nerding out and let everybody go. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Alice. It was so much fun like talking about like weird cool medical science facts and just like i love talking about science i think it's so cool i could talk about this all day i'm a science nerd but yeah so thank you so much for joining me and thank you to everyone who's watching the episode um you can check us out on any of the streaming services on youtube check out our instagram page and we will be seeing you next time yes thanks everyone bye bye